My name is Patrick McGinnis, and I'm the guy who invented the term FOMO. That's short for fear of missing out. Today, FOMO is an epidemic, and it's changing us so much that it sort of feels like we're evolving into a new species. But FOMO doesn't have to take over your life. You can find the power to choose what you actually want and the courage to miss out on the rest. I'll show you how right here on FOMO Sapiens. FOMO. Welcome to FOMO Sapiens, powered by AW360. This is the show about how to find the power to choose what you actually want out of business and life and the courage to miss out on the rest. I'm your host, Patrick McGinnis. I am credited as the guy who invented the term FOMO, and I'm coming at you live from New York City, the city that has more FOMO than just about anything else. And today we're going to be talking about social media and FOMO, and I want to take you back about a year to what I consider to be the most epic moment of global FOMO that I can think of in terms of something that just completely went crazy, and that is Firefest. And if you forgot what Firefest is, it was this event that took place in the Bahamas where a bunch of social media influencers started promoting this music fest, um, and they basically got many, many people to spend lots of money to fly to this island in hopes of seeing all kinds of supermodels and performers, and there were bands booked, and Ja Rule was involved, and then it turned out, once people actually got there, that they weren't ready, the entire festival was a bust, and people started posting pictures on their social media of the fact that instead of having a gourmet dinner, they were eating cheese sandwiches, and they had to be um, evacuated, and they were miserable, and they cried and moaned, and it looked pretty bad because we live in a time when people actually are suffering, and when people are worried about their cheese sandwich and the fact that they aren't able to see their favorite band perform, um, a lot of people don't feel too bad for them. And so there was this global backlash. Um, everybody got involved. It was written about. And the guy who organized the whole thing is actually now being sued for lots of money. And the whole thing turned out to be a disaster that was fueled by social media and influencers. So we're going to talk about how social media is used to manipulate you, to make you do things, and how people can use social media for good and actually to promote themselves. And we have the perfect guy to talk about that. And this is Ryan Williams. Ryan Williams is a thought leader, and I know we use that term a lot these days, but he is a real thought leader um, in the world of social media influencing. He has a podcast called Tales from the Influencer Economy, where he has interviewed more than 100 different people, people like Seth Godin. Um, about what it means to live in the influencer economy in which we live today. He has worked at startups that were acquired by companies like Disney and Warner Brothers. He has spoken at companies like Google, and he basically is the kind of guy that I like to rap about these things with, so that's why I wanted to have him on the show. Most importantly, he is from Des Moines, Iowa, um, and he now lives in Los Angeles, so he knows what, it like, what it's like to live a world that does not have FOMO, because if you grew up in a place like Des Moines, um, and I grew up in the state of Maine, you know what it's like to grow up in a place that is much simpler uh, than a place like LA or New York. So, Ryan, welcome to FOMO Sapiens. Patrick, pumped for having me. Congrats on the new show. Thank you very much. Well, um, you know, before we get going, um, I always like to ask my guests, the ones that I know, how do we actually know each other? We know each other through my podcast, where you were a guest. And I believe we reached out to one another. I can't remember if you found me or I found you. Uh, but we met through, I think, a cold email. It was like one of us emailed the other to collaborate. It was definitely me. So, I was de- uh, you were, you, you're the, you know, I was coming to you, hands outstretched, um, hoping to be on your show, and you were kind enough to have me on. So, um, but since that point, of course, we've been in touch. Well, I get, uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pitches a month, and... I respond to 5%. So you, whatever you said was a knockout, a killer cold pitch email. Wow. So my book was called The 10% Entrepreneur, but I was actually the 5% podcastrepreneur in that case. Yeah, you were the 5% uh, cold outreach, uh, stone cold killer uh, entrepreneur. <laughs> that was a terrible joke. And you, you let me, you didn't even make fun of me. I appreciate that. Um, hey, this, hey, yes, yes. And, <laughs> um, okay. So, so let's, let's, I want to, I want to start by just, you know, I, we, you heard the open there talking about Firefest. Um, where were you during Firefest? I think, you know, we, <laughs> probably about six people will remember and be able to answer that question. But what did you think when you read that? I mean, how did that, you know, as somebody who thinks about 
influencers and social networks and how they affect people? Like, how did you react to that craziness? Well, first of all, I was not on the island when it happened. <laughs> and I was like most of us. I heard about it as it was going on and after the fact, as they kept outing the founder as being a scam artist, snake oil sales person who was scamming people to pay prepaying for a big exclusive trip. And like most of us, we were, I was, you know, surprised, shocked, um, you know, but I also knew that this was where we're going with pre-sales and most of us buy things on speculation. And so I found out about it on Twitter and there was such outrage. A lot of journalists, techies, thought leaders, the word you just mentioned, were so mad about it that I, I didn't take as a much offense to it. I felt like almost the reaction of people that were so irate about it was equally as, as interesting as the actual like uh, scandal itself. Yeah, so the backlash. I mean, it is true. We live in a time where whatever you do, I mean, so for example, I was um, I was on Fox News on the weekend, which was something I'd never done before. Um, it was a new experience. And I was copied on this tweet that promoted the show. And they said, you know, up this morning is Sean Spicer and um, Seb, um, I can't remember the guy's name, but one of the other advisors who everybody hated and, um, <laughs> you know, who's controversial, I should say, and, and myself. And I am not a political person, at least overtly. And I was talking about something that had nothing to do with politics. And I got trolled. My entire Saturday was people telling me that I was worthless, no good and terrible. Um, and I think that you're right. Like it's when you have these backlashes, there's a lot of anonymous anger and hate and it's definitely in Firefest, people really came out of the woodwork freaking out and attacking back. Well, I, I actually, you know, we're Facebook friends. And so I'll bring your, you posted on Facebook about being on Fox and your feed was really funny. Cause some people said, I watched it with my five-year-old on my couch. Great job, Patrick. And other people were abhorrently offended by it. And I think a lot of times outrage on the internet is something that has happened so fast. It's like a, it's like a bonfire that starts with a match. And so this festival, you know, really epitomizes outrage when really we should be more upset with ourselves because we want to be tricked into these kind of things. Like everyone who signed up for that program was a willing participant and knew it was a risk. So how shocked could you be that you got completely bamboozled? It's not like anyone's lives were lost just some time, some money, and I have very little sympathy for the people that actually purchased uh, the tickets to go on this program. Yeah, and it's, it reminds me, if I think back to, um, I, you know, I wasn't around in this time, but there was in the 1950s and 1940s and, and you know, a long time ago, Hollywood actors would smoke cigarettes and they would do these commercials where they would be like, wow, what a, you know, your cigarette looks so glamorous. Like, does it taste great? And people, you know, thought that was really glamorous and they would want to buy cigarettes. And it was this whole weird influencer driven way of promoting something that was fundamentally bad for yeah. you. And what has happened today is that that has just translated into the web. I mean, you know, if you look at the, the major influencers online, they all have millions of followers. They're following like three people and they're using their channel as a way to basically monetize their celebrity by getting people to buy things they don't need or want, right? Well, the, uh, social media itself is, an, is created to be an addiction. It's created to be a habit. I mean, I hate to admit it, but I check my Twitter feed when I wake up in bed sometimes. I usually check my email. Uh, I, it, I uninstalled the Facebook app on my phone because I was sick of using Facebook at 2 in the morning to lurk on people. And ultimately, uh, there's this great, in early 2000s, a study about Wikipedia and how communities uh, are created and managed online. And so 1% of people that use Wikipedia write the entries. 10% um, of the people curate and edit the entries. And then everyone else is a lurker. So 89% of us are lurkers, ourselves included. And ultimately, we're the ones that fall victim to feeling like we're missing out. So the whole thesis of this show is that there's FOMO, but ultimately these influencers, the one percenters, really drive us to feel left out. And to your point, they don't follow a lot of people because it's hard to keep up with more than 200 people, right? If your Facebook friend group is 5,000 in your network, like there's no way you can have strong or even weak ties. Majority of those people you'll have no ties with, but you met them at a networking conference or you went to a dinner and they were there and then suddenly you're watching them at, a, at their wedding and you're wondering, how did I end up this way? So influencers, it's a great indicator that they can't follow all these people, yet the perception of their influence is so high that they expect us to follow them. 
Totally. And you know what always blows my mind is when you see these people who you've never even heard of that have 250,000 followers. And I often wonder, I mean, I, I don't know if you've looked at this, but just how many of these people are just buying fake users. But it seems to me like what's happening more and more is we're seeing the ex- that's getting exposed that as companies are starting to become more savvy, they're also realizing that there's a lot of fakery and that it's at the end of the day, it's not really worth paying people to do these things in the first place. Absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of vanity metrics. I talk a lot about how likes, impressions, and followers are all fake metrics. And they're driven up by people in the advertising industry to help make money and and sell and uh, drive purchase decisions. So if you have a lot of likes, it doesn't matter. If you have a lot of followers, definitely doesn't matter. And impressions for people in the advertising community know that that's a bunch of vaporware because you want conversions, you want sales, you want even clicks are better. And so the funny thing about influencers is, is the habits they create are every Tuesday they have a new video that comes out. Every Monday there's a new podcast episode. Or every month they do a collaboration with some other famous YouTube creator. So we're driven by that. These people become addictive forces in our life. And then subconsciously we are going to follow them as purchase decision makers for us. Because you know what? People are lazy. We are lazy. We don't even want to read books. We want the books to be simple. We want to be told what to buy and told what to do. And I know that sounds cynical, but as an author, you know this, that you can't write really complex books that make people think because we are so distracted with time that we are battling for people's attention from Twitter, from Netflix, from talking to the guy at the cubicle next to us. So ultimately, we are having to dumb down a lot of what we do. And so, you know, as lazy people, we have to rely on these fake influential people that have 250,000 followers, many of which are bot or fake or people that logged on to Twitter once and are no longer on the platform. And that's just, it makes it easier for us. You know, at the end of the day, there's an an ease of use to follow an influencer, especially if I'm going to get that diet of their content every Monday, once a week. And I know it's in my inbox and it helps me escape from my day. So I mean, that, that all is true. And it's, it's funny because I was reading, I don't watch The Bachelorette, um, nor have I ever watched it, but I was reading a review this morning. And one of the bachelors on the show, his job is social media personality. And in fact, I, I, um, I spoke at, at, a, at, a, at a middle school in Maine last year uh, about, for career day about writing and other things like that. And I asked the kids what they wanted to do when they grew up. And a full one half of the kids in the class, probably seventh and eighth grade, wanted to be YouTube celebrities, which is, um, which is really fascinating. And, you know, and it kind of frightening. It is. I mean, I guess it's the other half wanted to be illustrators, which, so we're going to have a tremendous glut of illustrators and YouTube celebrities coming out of the state of Maine in about 10 years. Um, <laughs> but given all that, I mean, we kind of laid out the, you know, I, the issues and the problems, but you have written a book um, that I, that I had the pleasure of reading and we've discussed and you created a lot of content around the influencer economy. And obviously, um, there are lots of good things that come out of this world. And, you know, there is, we have an unprecedented, I guess, flattening and democratization of access to, uh, communication that people can tell their stories that you can have a little girl who's stuck in a building in Aleppo raising consciousness about what's happening in that city. There's all these interesting things happening. And there's also business opportunities out there to actually build businesses and be an entrepreneur online. So I'd love to hear from you, you know, leaving aside, you know, what are the very obvious flaws in the model? What are the opportunities for people that want to make social media work for them? Well, there's social media. The beauty of it is there's a two-way communication. You're not reading a newspaper where there's no interaction. There's no buttons on the Wall Street Journal, physical copy. Uh, You're not watching TV where you have a tuner. And you're not in a movie theater with a bunch of strangers watching a film. You're online with all these people and you're online with buttons and you're online with the media. And so that communication is, is imperative. And I feel like, you know, Seth Godin, is one of the bigger well-known business authors. And he talks about how when you create a tribe, which is a community, you need a shared way to communicate and a vision. And I add that element in the influencer economy is you need a way to collaborate. And so collaboration is key. And one of my favorite people that I've, profile in my book was uh, Hannah Hart. Have you heard of Hannah Hart? She has a YouTube channel called My Drunk Kitchen. Yes, yes, of course. And she now has a TV show on the Food Network of the same name. She started making YouTube videos in her apartment where she 
uh, was cooking surprisingly drunk for her friend on this early YouTube channel. I call channel. that Tuesday morning, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, I call that like, you know, every uh, Sunday afternoon. But yeah, she uh, she just made a Tuesday night. She was drunk and made food and made a video that she shared online and went viral. And then she like, said to herself, I want to double down on this. I want to go to L.A. And she was living in New York at the time. And I'm going to make a career out of this. And so she was accidentally famous. And I think a lot of these people in the influencer economy were unintentionally rich and rich by a network, rich by a community, rich by money. And so their consequences were that they started doing things very early. They didn't necessarily manufacture a lot of the success. And I found that truly influential people, they gave, like Hannah, she gave her community ownership of her work. And by that, I mean, she treated her community like a partner, like an equal, and her customer base came from that. So she would answer every YouTube comment. And the best story about her is, she went in the YouTube comments and she realized that people in her community wanted a tour and not just any tour where she'd go play at comedy shows or do, do uh, some sort of act. She wanted to help her community because they wanted her to uh, cook drunk in uh, their kitchen. So she did the My Drunk Kitchen tour. She raised $250,000. And this is the absurdity of the internet. She could do this through Indiegogo. And then she went around the country and then to North America and then to Europe getting drunk, cooking in people's kitchens. What that did was two things. One, it made people psychologically involved in the content, right? So they, they felt like motivated to be a part of the experience. Two, the propensity to collaborate with people and have them in your content makes it more likely for them to share your content. And so there's a byproduct of all of this. And so she was able to understand that really community ownership, which I call giving uh, emotional ownership over your content, where they feel like not just, hey, I'm a fan of you, I like to buy your stuff. It's like actually I'm making this with you because there's a element of collaboration here. How is that, you know, the word that uh, that became very trendy last year that everybody wanted to talk about in the world of business and marketing was the word authentic. It was kind of like it was a kind of like the word authentic of Brussels sprouts. About two years ago, everybody started serving Brussels sprouts at restaurants in New York, and then it was like gone, and now it's cauliflower, and next year it'll be something else. But authenticity had its toast. Well, yeah, that's definitely, it's having its moment, right? Um, authenticity was the, the word about a year and a half ago. And you don't hear it anymore, but I, 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 I get it. I mean, I get authenticity because, you know, I think, you know, if you grow up in a place like Iowa or Maine, people are pretty darn authentic. How does that idea of, you know, sharing with your community play into authenticity or is authenticity like something completely different? I so I I have a, a podcast you know we mentioned you were a guest on and I've interviewed hundred of influential authors leaders on the internet and YouTubers and I ask many of them what the definition of authenticity is and uh, I've come to the conclusion that it's not a buzzword it's actually real and it simply means when your actions match your words hmm. and so what you say you back up with your actual your physical actions and there's a improv uh, book called uh, Finding Truth in Comedy, it's by Del Close and Sharna Halperin. And they talk about how when you find the truth in what you do, that that's what makes a good comedy scene from Saturday Night Live to the Groundlings to Second City. And I believe authenticity really is finding that truth in what you do and what you stand for that you can defend. And through my research, the majority of the YouTube creators, the podcasters, authors like yourself, you, you make bold proclamations and you stand up for them. And people respect the fact that even if you're wrong, what you're doing is defensible to you. And so I think a boldness comes from authenticity. And in the book, I profile Mark Marin, who is the podcast WTF that I'm sure many people here have, have listened to. And he's interviewed people from President Obama to Robin Williams to all these brilliant uh, comedians and getting them to open up about their depression, their insecurities, and their real shortcomings in life because he's able to identify that truth in what he does. And he talks about his alcoholism. He talks about recovering as an addict. He talks about being depressed, being divorced. And I feel like a lot of us, we don't want to let our guard down. But on the internet, that type of um, I, I, vulnerability is a buzzword, but let's just use it for now. That kind of vulnerability really creates a, a way to be accessible to people. So then ultimately they're emotionally connected, which is really all that matters in the long run with an influencer because you want people to connect connect with you emotionally at that level. 
That makes a lot of sense. How do you, I mean, I know you talk at a lot of companies and you're building, you have a, you know, a real speaking career. How do you translate, I mean, these kinds of insights and, and all of the work you've done into a corporate setting? Yeah. I, I, when I talk to corporations, I often, you know, reposition my work and, you know, talk about leading with influence and how most of us, like, I, I think I'll, what I always suggest to clients is you need to, when you're running a marketing campaign or a business or launching a product, you need to be the mayor of a small town. You need to know everyone's name. You need to find their problems. You need to solve their needs. You need to look at their pain points. And then from there becomes something bigger than you. And then you're working together and hopefully making money off of it. And so when you're thinking about running for mayor, you have to treat everything like a campaign and you have to build that base. You have to build what I call your collaborator base. And those are your 10 percenters. It goes back to that internet rule I mentioned with Wikipedia. Well, I've taken that paradigm and switched it. So the majority of us, you know, we have one percenters, which are the influencers, which, which we've talked about here. And then there's a 10 percent base that I call your collaborators. And those are the people that ultimately they are your early adopters. They're the people to prove out your business concepts. They're the first hires at your team, people on LinkedIn that are part of your network. And then 89 percent of everyone else are lurkers and lurkers. You don't you, you can ignore them. You can ignore any lurker because lurkers are late adopters. They're people that come on board way after the fact. They don't know what influencer tipped off your idea. They don't know who your early adopters were. They don't care that you use crowdfunding to launch your first movie. They care that it's on Netflix or Amazon and it can download in their living room. And so I always recommend in corporate environments, ignore 89% of everyone out there. Focus on the 1% or influencers but before that, go to those 10% core collaborators, which will help you build out your business. Wow. And, and, and do, you, do you have a company that you think does this particularly well that's really tuned into those people? I think that uh, one company that hasn't done it well is Google. If you think about most of their acquisitions are around YouTube, which are pre-existing platforms. But many of us remember uh, Google+. Plus. So uh, sorry, Google, if you're a sponsor of the show. But uh, Google+, Plus was terrible. Because they didn't I follow. I think it still is terrible. Be- it still exists, doesn't it? Just nobody. It's, it's like they, if they, it, it's an empty hall. They make us use it. Yeah, totally. <laughs> like going on spring break to the that <laughs> and having no one there on the trip to Firefest. <laughs> yeah, to Firefest for social media. Um, they didn't listen to to the community, and they no one wanted that product. They didn't do a lot of research. You know, they they didn't put it in the market to get feedback to make it better. And I think Twitter did a really good job when it launched. Uber, when it first launched, what they did really well was uh, Uber is a great example. They launched with the black car, which was a very exclusive, big um, ticket product, right? Before they launched UberX. And they had it only in big cities. And at the time, people were sharing on Foursquare, on uh, Twitter, Facebook, that they were using this really cool black car service. And then equally, they went to tech conferences like TechCrunch Disrupt. And I went to a conference called Lay Web in Paris. And wow. Lay Web, uh, you know, I'm just showing off right now that I go to conferences it's called it's Lay very Web. Very chic, but, man. That's all I got to yeah, say. Yeah, um, really hitting the audience right here, uh, name dropping. But they gave us all free town cars. And so we got the Uber app for free. So what do you think we all did? We all went back to our cities in America where Uber was launching and made uh, a huge case for all of our friends to try this new black car service. And then once we got that... Um, high-end adoption of rich people, or not myself included, but rich people that like town cars, then they went to UberX, and they found that more ordinary car person that loved to take a taxi that didn't want to deal with taxis. And then they found the demand of people that wanted to make extra money. So I feel like Uber did it really well. Now they have a terrible brand, and you know their C- new CEO is trying to rescue their, their identity because of just t- terrible management. But at the time, they did a wonderful job of uh, adopting. Now tell me... Um... As you think about all of this, I want to ask you a question. It's a yes/no question. Will Snapchat be around in five years? Uh, yeah, it will be around. And will it be a factor? Will it be a top five social network? Well, so Snapchat's really interesting because if you remember, they started as a, a bikini, naked, pictorial like text messaging app. I did a research project for a tech company I was consulting with, and I went back to the early iTunes comments of Snapchat like eight years ago, and they were all like, send me your pics. People were like just using it to send pics of themselves half naked. 
And then they caught on with college kids, right? So their first 10% core collaborator community were people wanting nudes online. (laughs) I'm not going to comment on that. You just keep going. Yeah, I I, I know, right? So this was, uh, but it's true. I mean, it's really interesting to think about. And then it went to college kids as their adoption group. So I feel like people that grew up on it in college are still going to have those habits. So yes, it will be here, but Instagram has ripped it off. Instagram moments, it's so much easier. Again, we're lazy. I don't want to open up two separate apps. I'd rather just have an app that I could use that is multi-purpose, which is the Instagram to share photos and then also to do moments. So I think it'll be around, but it's not going to be as big as Facebook. And so that begs the question, if you are somebody who has a huge Instagram, I'm sorry, Snapchat following, is it possible to port that following to another platform like an Instagram where you can continue to grow it? Or do you think it's hard to do that? Because I know Vine, when Vine went away, some people did that, some people didn't. What's the secret to doing that? Yeah, so the this uh, whole conversation around collaboration, how to, yeah, the word you used was port your audience over, migrate it over. And that's true influence, right? If I can build a a 10,000 person email list, a 50,000 person Instagram following, 100,000 Facebook fans. That's true influence, right? Because my audience lives everywhere. Um, with Snapchat, you can't uh, put links into your feed. You can't put links in your profile. It's really hard to port that audience over. You have to drive people through a call to action. I think it's really hard. It's going to be very difficult for people. Like it, At this point, if you're that invested in Snapchat, that's the addiction we're talking about. Is Snapchat is smart in that they have all these influencers that have huge followings. And if it suddenly goes away, then they're losing all these followers that they spent years building, which would be really, uh, I don't know, defeating if you spent all this time building a, a Snapchat following and then suddenly you, you don't want to use it anymore. Yeah, so that, that is, uh, that is the, the, the advice that I would give to all of you Snap, Snapchat celebrities. Before it's too late, you need to find Ryan's book. You need to read it. You need to do what he says so that you can actually create a community that will survive and thrive no matter what happens because um, diversification, whether it's in your career or it's in your uh, social media strategy, is a really important part to building anything that's sustainable. Uh, Ryan, this has been super interesting and um, I could... I think, you know, this is a conversation we'll continue, but I wanted to make sure that everybody who's listening knows where to find you, find your book, find out about all the things that you're working on. So tell us where to find you. Uh, yeah, thanks. This has been really fun. Uh, go to influencerkami.com and you can find uh, all my resources, my hundred plus podcast episodes, a lot of the research I publish around influence. And then uh, Amazon, you can go to influencer economy or search Ryan Williams and then search Ryan Williams and iTunes. And I'll actually, I can make a special link for the people watching this. If they go to influencer economy.com slash Patrick, I can give them, you know, a free lesson guide for how to grow your online influence through, uh, through collaboration, which is all about, you know, the steps to building a platform and, and building a base and then going after your influencers. Thanks for doing that. That's awesome. And I will also download it because um, I know how to spell that link. That's for sure. It's um, simple. It's simple. <laughs> Again, people are lazy. Yes, they definitely are. And I am the principal one. Um, okay. Well, thanks a lot, Ryan. It's really been fun having you here. And it's my pleasure to be able to host you on my show um, after being on yours. Um, for everybody else, um, if you want to learn more about the 10% entrepreneur, my work, and if you want to connect with me on social media, everything but Snapchat, which I quit a year ago, you can go to my website, www.patrickmcginnis.com. You can also find information about my book, The 10% Entrepreneur, where you can learn how to be an entrepreneur part-time and defeat your entrepreneurial FOMO. And so um, until I see you next time, take care of yourself on social media, read Ryan's book, check out um, my website, and I look forward to seeing you next time on FOMO Sapiens. FOMO. FOMO. FOMO.